Good morning, everybody, and you're all very welcome to this online seminar brought to you by the National Rural Network. My name is Declan Phelan, and I'll be your host for the for today's seminar. As you can see on screen now, we have a, a full agenda for the morning. The, the first section will run for approximately one hour and will include a questions and answers session. Our first two speakers are Dale Crammon from the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, who will speak about sectorial emissions, ceiling, and what it means for uh, Irish agriculture. Second speaker will be Catherine Keena from Chagas, who will go through hedgerow, hedgerow management and the importance of these in relation to emissions, biodiversity and agriculture as a whole. We will then have a question and answer session. This, the second session then will be moderated by Noel Feeney, who is the president of the, of the Agricultural Consultants Association. And we'll have three main speakers in this section, which will be Geraldine O'Sullivan from IFA Smart Farming, Lillian O'Sullivan from Chagas and Doug McMillan from the Soil Carbon EIP. Then this session will conclude with a panel discussion and a questions and answer session, all moderated by Noel. So without any further ado, um, I'm gonna hand you over to the first speaker. Who's gonna, I'm gonna ask Dale to share his screen. And while he's doing so, I'll, I'll introduce him. So Dale Cram is an agriculture inspector working in the climate change and bioenergy policy division within the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. He's currently focused on the issue of agricultural greenhouse gas, methane and nitrous oxide. Given that 34% of all greenhouse gas emissions in Ireland come from the agri-food sector, with methane accounting for approximately two thirds of the agricultural total, there is a keen interest within the agricultural the Irish government to find viable solutions to reduce the climate footprint of their livestock dominated agri-food production systems. Over to you, Dale. Uh, thank you very much, Declan. It's, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, thank, you, thank you all for the invitation. Uh, so of about uh, 15, 16 slides, just, uh, you know, setting out a little bit of the background uh, and where we're going in relation to the agriculture targets. And I'll touch a little bit on the on the land use uh, side also. I don't deal with it, um, but I have a few slides here that my colleague Philip Blackwell shared with me. So I think it's just important before we get into the, the actual meat of the presentation, uh, just to reflect on, on, on where we are and I suppose um, the direction of travel and what has been driving this. I think the whole area of climate really started to take focus, I think, uh, around the time the Paris Agreement uh, was, was agreed uh, in 2015. And we all know that the objective there is to limit temperature rise to less than two degrees and, and pursue efforts to limit uh, temperature rise to less than 1.5 degrees. And I suppose as a response to that, a couple of years later, a new commission came in, we saw the European Green Deal. And within that, there were two key pillars uh, focusing on the farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy. And then more recently, the, the proposed nature restoration law and potentially what that might mean for, for land use going forward. The Commission have a target of to reduce emissions by 55%. I think that's going to go to 57% now, uh, reduction by 2030. And it's undoubtedly, as a whole, agriculture will have to play its part, both within Europe uh, and also uh, clearly here domestically. Just overall, a, a little bit on the farm to fork. So what, what it's trying to do, uh, it clearly wants to reduce the environmental and climate footprint of the food system, uh, ensuring food security and public health, uh, lead a global transition towards a competitive, sustainable from farm to fork, tap into new opportunities around carbon farming, et cetera, uh, and overall just to create that robust and resilient food system that's going to take us forward towards, towards 2050 in terms of that overall climate neutral uh, goal. So in response to that, we, we, we at government, we had to, we had to look at this and consider this. Uh, we we were we had the climate action plan in 2019 and there was sectoral emission reduction targets set out for that for all sectors of the economy and for agriculture the reduction target was a 10 to 15 percent reduction in agricultural greenhouse gas emissions and this was the, the ag climatized roadmap which i was involved in in developing which was published in december 2020 it was predicated on this emissions reduction that we would have to reduce emissions by 10 to 15 percent i suppose the new government came in then uh, we had a climate action amendment act uh, which stepped up ambition uh, across the economy the climate action plan in 2021 it set out that we had to achieve a 51 percent reduction in emissions 
by 2030 across the economy based on 2018 levels. So clearly agriculture was going to have to step up its ambition from 10 to 15 percent to to contribute towards that 51 percent reduction. The climate action plan is for 2023 is currently being 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 finalized as we speak. Uh, the expectation is that it will be published over the next week or two, uh, certainly before the end of the year. So just to, 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 to very kind of briefly kind of set out the, the Climate Change Advisory Council proposed carbon budget. So we have to start thinking about this in a little bit in a slightly different way. So we have now the economy can emit 295 million tonnes of CO2 in the first carbon budget period and 200 million tonnes in the second carbon budget period. So the percentage reduction is 4.8% in the first budget and an average of 8.3% in the second carbon budget. And the thinking here is that we're, we need to allow time for the technologies to be developed in order to accelerate those reductions in the second carbon budget period. So agriculture, in the end, um, as you know, there was a lot of debate over the summer in the media in June and July in the, in the lead up to the decision. Uh, agriculture had been set a range, a reduction range of, of 22 to 30 percent. And in the end, uh, government agreed to a 25 percent reduction for agriculture. Uh, with, as I said, an indicative kind of landing point of 20 million tons in 2025 and 17.25 million tons in in 2030. Well as I said we we it's not just the landing point that we have to consider because we as I said this is framed slightly differently now and that we have these carbon budgets so effectively these are envelopes of carbon emissions that each sector can emit. So in the case of agriculture we have a budget of 106 million tons. Now, we've already used about 23 million tonnes of that in 2021. So that leaves us uh, with a budget of about 83 million tonnes for the, for the remaining four years of the budget. So for argument's sake, if we don't make early progress in 2022 and 2023, the reductions required in 2024 and 2025 are going to be more severe. Uh, because it's a budget envelope rather than getting to an end point and the, that end point being 17.25 million tonnes in 2030. So some key areas that have activity that, that we're looking at with, with, with in the department, uh, I suppose this year we had uh, Minister McConnell have set up two uh, food vision groups, one on beef and one on dairy. They have both finished their work um, reports have been submitted to the minister, which, which are now under consideration. We will be looking clearly more at the whole area of agri-led agri biomethane. Uh, there's clearly an onus there to develop some sort of strategy around this. Uh, we've talked about this for a while, but we need now to ensure that appropriate financial supports are put in place to enable us to develop a, an anaerobic digestion of biomethane industry. On the land use side, and I will be touching on that in a while, um, there was no sectoral emission ceiling set for, for, for land use in the Lulu CF sector. And the reason for that was there was considerable uncertainty in the inventory. The inventory had a, a significant refinement just at the time we were looking at this. And it was felt that it will be more prudent to wait and um, carry out a, 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 a land use review, which had started or complete the land use review, and then consider that in the whole. So we don't expect any decision, final decision to be taken and that maybe to, you know, towards the end of the year or, or, or perhaps into, into, into 2024. We're also looking at the area of carbon farming and very much following out what the commission are doing here. Um, they had a publication recently in terms of setting out, you know, some of the, the rules and the accountancy around this and how it will work in terms of the principle of additionality that you can only pay, I suppose, a farmer for, for taking additional actions in relation to, to carbon sequestration on their farms. These are just a, a couple of the key measures, core measures, as I would uh, define them, that uh, were featured in the Climate Action Plan in, in 2021. 
there'll undoubtedly feature in future climate change strategies. Effectively, we need to reduce chemical nitrogen usage. Chemical nitrogen usage was down about 16% this year, which is quite significant. I suspect that was based on purchases. I suspect usage was down a little bit more as, as farmers bought forward uh, because of the ongo ongoing situation in Ukraine. We need to increase our adoption of protected urea. So protected urea is a urea-based nitrogen product that has a urease inhibitor uh, on the coating of, 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 the, of the, the product. And effectively, that reduces emissions of nitrous oxide. So in agriculture, our two big uh, emissions are methane, which is about 65-70% of total emissions, and then nitrous oxide accounts for about 25% of emissions. Earlier finishing of beef cattle. So clearly, if the animal uh, gets to its target weight earlier, it's it's removed from the inventory. So if you think about it, that animals might be like 26 months of age that went to a third year. If you can bring those animals back, say, into like 23 months of age, well, then they'll stay in the one to two year old category. So effectively, you're removing animals from that category eh, and it'll have a direct impact on methane and nitrous oxide emissions. So this is a key thing that the beef industry, eh, you know, will be looking at and, and, and beef farmers have to have to carefully consider. We'll also be having a, a, a very key focus on uh, animal breeding and uh, the whole area of, of breeding for low methane traits. I think this is very important, what the whole area of animal breeding can do. We're very lucky to have the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation in Ireland. They've one of the largest databases of, of, of individual uh, pieces of information on livestock anywhere in the world. And we really need data is king. We really need to use that data uh, to step forward now and really make a, a, a difference on what the methane levels those animals produce. So we can make significant progress uh, by 2030. And obviously then out to 2035 and 2040, that's where you'll start to see the really, really big gains hopefully coming through. There's a target to increase organic farming. It's a key part of the CAP strategic program. Uh, there's a very attractive, as you know, funding uh, being put in place, uh, you know, for the program, a couple of hundred million over, over the next few years. Uh, we also need to improve animal feed, feeding, looking at crude protein. 3 nap is a feed additive that started to be tried commercially now on some winter milk farms over, over, over the winter. So that's very encouraging again. 3 nap in an indoor house system reduces methane emissions by 30%. So it's all about finding the solutions uh, that work in an Irish context. They will also look then at other miscellaneous measures such as extended grazing, which helps, and then looking at the whole area of methane in the slurry, both from an AD point of view and also an additive point of view and trying to reduce that methane. The holy grail, I suppose, in some ways then is, is, is taking that uh, feed out of 3 up and developing a pasture-based version of it. It only works really in the indoor house system at the moment where you continually feed it to the animal. But if we could develop a slow release bolus where the active ingredient is working uh, in the animal as they graze outdoors, well, then we will be able to deliver much greater mitigation potential, you know, from, from our grazed animals. And then finally, diversification into alternative land uses, but forestry and AD, that's clearly going to play a role as well out to 2030 in terms of meeting our targets. Packers uh, have this slide, which I've borrowed and wish to acknowledge. Um, They've set out that, that you know, I suppose we're starting in 2018 at 23 million tonnes. The end point in 2030 is 17.25 million tonnes, as, as I have spoken about. If we implement the technologies in the MAC, you were aware of the Chagas MAC. I've touched on many of those technologies in that previous slide, not all of them. Uh, we will abate about 1.52 million tonnes. Then we move on then to the almost ready technologies. I spoke about them, the feed additives, the fertilizer, the area slaughter, that could give an additional one, one and a half megatons. And then, as I said, the, the, the feed additives of pasture will be the third stage and the final stage in that journey, hopefully, and the breeding, the low emitting animals that will all help us, you know, get to where we need to be. And then stepping on past that out to 2050 in terms of that climate neutral agriculture.
So look, I'm going to leave it there in agriculture. I'm going to switch tack now um, to, the, to the land use side. As I said, no sector of emission ceiling was set for agriculture, but we've, we've still a commitment there in the Climate Action Plan 2021 to, to deliver on the actions that were set out, regardless of whether a, a legal framework was set for it. So just I suppose to recap, you can see that um, on the grassland side, we have about 330 hectares of, of drained peat soils, uh, and they're emitting approximately 9 million tonnes. We're doing a lot of work at the moment to refine the emission factors around this, so they may be slightly off, but this is what's currently estimated in the inventory. And then our mineral soils sequester carbon. So the, the net balance, I suppose, is, is that our soils are still a source of emissions. And some people, you know, um, um, it, it, it just needs to be explained that, that the fact that these peat-based soils are emitting more than the grassland soils are sequestering. So on the on the on the grasslands on these drained organic soils, um, you know, we 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 there's an issue here and that's, you know, soils with high organic matter, when they're drained, it allows the air into the soil and it breaks down the organic matter and this releases CO2 into the atmosphere. So this is this is why that number is there. And obviously we should try and address this from, from a climate uh, point of view. So within the Climate Action Plan 2021, there was a, an objective, there was a requirement to, to reduce the management intensity of 80,000 hectares of drained organic soils by 2030. So some of the things that we'll have to look at will be lower stocking rates, uh, reducing fertilizer or no fertilizer use. So it'll very much uh, marry in with the agriculture measure in terms of reducing that overall nitrogen, uh, not cleaning the drains, um, deep drain to shallow drains, and then, you know, blocking the drains and raising the water table slightly. I think it's important to acknowledge here, we're not talking about flooding the land here. Um, and I think I think that's important, um, you know, for me to say that. It's, it's about changing the management intensity and raising the water table slightly that we, we stop that breakdown or the organic matter in the soils. Um, but we still would hope to be able to carry out, you know, grazing on that land, you know, particularly on in the spring and the summer period. And that and that's really important to, to acknowledge. On the mineral soils, then there was an objective to improve the management intensity of, of 450,000 hectares of, of mineral soils. So again, by taking actions like improved fertilizer management in relation to liming, liming is incredibly important. The department have a liming support scheme there at the moment. Uh, liming allows you to bring the pH of the soil to the correct level. You can then reduce your chemical fertilizer application because you will get a better response from that nitrogen that you apply to your land when the pH is correct. It's almost the first thing that a farmer should be looking at in 2023, in my view, to make sure that the pH of his, of, of his or her soils are, are correct. Uh, other measures around this will be kind of, you know, avoiding compaction, you know, practical kind of real measures that will improve that soil quality and, and, and hopefully increase that sequestration, increasing legumes, clover, multi-species. That, that's all part of it. Um, I suppose building the resilience in our soils and, uh, and you know, to climate change itself, but also uh, helping, you know, uh, reduce um, the greenhouse gas emissions and improving the, the carbon footprint of, of our farms. On the cropland side, then there's there's uh, an objective to increase the inclusion of cover crops and tillage to at least 50,000. So these are quite small measures, the last two. They're not going to make a huge difference to the overall inventory, but they're still important. Again, just in the context of, 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 of that resilience um reduce nitrogen leaching from a water quality perspective. So it really focusing on, I suppose, spring cereal growers on the tillage side, that if you look over the winter period when the land is fallow, there is a degree of, of, of leaching that occurs. So if we can put in a cover crop, we can stop that occurring. And we can also then, you know, create a, you know, a grazing or fodder opportunity for, for our livestock. So increasing that kind of supply of feed you know, domestically. So that, that, that's really important too. 
And then finally, as I said, the, the, the other one is about increasing the incorporation of straw to at least 10% of the tillage cereal area by 2030. Again, a small measure in terms of what will contribute in the context of the overall inventory. But again, it, 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 it reduces fertilizer use, you know, on the tillage farm and improves that soil carbon sequestration and improves the workability of, of, of the soil going forward. It's not going to happen overnight. But as a practice going forward, if, if as a tillage farmer, if you get into this, I think there will be rewards there. So there's a scheme there again, for, I think for next year, building on the scheme of 2022 to support farmers to do this. So I think that's it. Uh, that was a, a whistle stop tour through, I suppose, just our high level targets. You know, some of the measures we're going to need to take and then moving on to the land use side. We've no legal framework on the land use side. But that will come. But that's we need to get on and start implementing those measures in 2023. Thank you very much, Declan. Thank you very much, Dale. Brilliant presentation. And uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions coming in there in the next few minutes. Um, just in relation to the questions, if you want to pop them in the Q&A tab, we have John and, and Margaret here that are going through them and trying to pull them up for the, the present presenters. So while Catherine is sharing her slide, I will introduce her. So Catherine Keenan leads the Biodiversity and Agri-Environment KT program within Chagas. She's worked on the agri-environment schemes from the start of REPS in 1995 and has recently completed a PhD in biodiversity management. So I see Catherine's presentation on screen there, was on yeah. screen. Yeah. We'll go sure. again. PD, not the PDF one, yeah. Perfect. Look, Catherine, I let you work away. And as I said, <laughs> pop the questions into the Q&A box and we'll have a, a question answer sec session later on. Okay, just want to um, hide my presenter view, so it should be on the one screen. Okay, um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm talking about hedges. I normally talk about biodiversity. Um, all the birds and mammals and bats and bees and moths and butterflies, um, they have been described as our um, Amazonian rainforest throughout the country, uh, but they're also valuable for uh, carbon and food and water and shelter, and they're just so, so special. Um, that I love them. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, I have kind of three messages to remember from the presentation. Um, I really think for, for whatever value we are managing them for, and in general, I don't think there's any conflict uh, between which uh, ecosystem service we're aiming for. We The most important thing, and I think it's where we failed most over the last 30 years, is that not to distinguish between two basic categories of hedges, and therefore we muddle up the management. And my simple message is we don't, shouldn't top our escaped hedges, and we don't let our topped hedges escape. And we will go into that. We'll talk about planting hedges, which is strongly supported now under acres. Again, we need to decide which type of hedge before you start or we're in for a, a, a bad a bad end for, for all. And then this, the third one, again, which is supported in, in acres is to coppice upside down tallish brush hedges rather than our um, escaped hedges. And that would be particularly from a carbon and a biodiversity point of view. So just to explain this really importance about the two hedges, um, some people might consider the one on the right a hedge, especially when you look at it stark in autumn. But um, that and 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 you would, you know, it's it's um it's a hedge that was these both of these hedges would have been planted two hundred years ago. The one on the left and the right, the one on the right would never have been topped. Um, the trees would be dominating, and um, it's you could call it a, some people call it a tree line, some people call it a linear woodland. Um, but that makes up, you know, half of the hedges in Ireland. On, on the left hand side, then a hedge, which is maybe more typically kind of talked as the managed hedge. So there are two clearly different types, both with different managements, both good. We want we want both types on farms. The escaped hedge again there on the left. Um, in summer, you know, it looks a full thick hedge, but it's it's primarily a line of trees. And then the top hedge there on the right at the back, in, but does include the occasional trees. And the principle is for, for any of us who, who aren't foresters is to understand this apical dominance. When you plant either an oak tree or a white thorn, its whole ambition is life is to grow into a tree with a single stem, a single bowl and a canopy, a top heavy canopy full of fruit and flowers. And that's the normal way a tree grows. 
And you can see it on the top here. It's an ash, which has been, you could call it pollarded or cut above the wire. And then it grows on. Um, it, it, apical dominance would mean, you know, instead of one, then the apical dominance is, is, is changed into, um, you know, multiple uh, apical, apical dominance trying to, to grow up into being the, the, the mature the canopy. And similarly on the bottom then would be a classic, um, what we're calling the upside down toilet brush hedge. Uh, where you know it was on its way to being a uh, white thorn, a line of white thorn trees, and then when it was cut, wherever it's cut, and the little diagram shows there, wherever you cut it, it multiplies. That is why white thorn is such a good hedging species. So again, just some pictures tell it all. The escaped hedges never been topped. We can call them tree lines, linear woodlands. I don't mind. I rather keep them in the hedgerow uh, family, and they are. Um, they were planted, as I said, in that hedgerow. Again, other examples. A picture says a thousand words. These to me are all escaped hedges. Um, so I could show you, you know, we could break them into further types. I used to call the ones, uh, the one on the bottom left hand, a relic hedge. But either way, it's an escaped hedge, if you know what I mean. I think we just need to break them into the two categories. Um, and then uh, the value of the escaped hedge is primarily in the canopy. If you go back and see there, you know, the base can be thin, um, but it's the canopy full of fruit and flowers and therefore bees and bats and birds and, and uh, et cetera, make use of the, the, the primary, primary uh, biodiversity value is in the canopy. Um, and the best practice management for these kind of hedges is to never top them, just keep trimming the sides um, you know, side trimming is always OK not to to have it coming out into the field. If we're happy to have a, 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 a woodland uh, edge wider, that's fine. But from a farming point of view, there's never any problem in side trimming. So side trim only and never top um, for those hedges. And again, then the second type then is the topped hedges. Now, and this is a good topped hedge. Um, this was planted um, back in uh, back in 2006 in Kildalton, it was uh, pruned as we'll talk about at the moment. It was thick, it was layered up all the way, so every time it was multiplied up, and now that's kind of 15 foot high. And occasional again, a thorn tree retained there. Um, but the apical dominance has been managed from day one, and will always be managed. Um, it, it, the, the correct thing there is to keep that topped if we wanted to keep that lovely thick base. Um, and I worry about a move towards some suggestions about we shouldn't cut hedges altogether. You know, that is confusing the argument. This hedge, little and often, I actually prefer annual cutting there, provided you leave your occasional trees, then um, that will, a bull won't go through that as a post there, but actually the wire was taken down off that hedge and nothing will go through it. So the biodiversity value of the top hedge then is well, it's primarily in the in the dense base. You can see there it's full of fruit and flowers, full of um, cover and hiding places and, and for the birds. And then in the occasional trees, again, where it's not a line of trees here in cross section, it might look as if there is, but you can see from my other picture, I would only have occasional trees coming up in that hedge because the hedge, the tree isn't good for the hedge, um, and uh, but it's good for it's a balance. We need we need trees in every top hedge, and we particularly need thorn trees. Um, Rex would have done a good job of leaving uh, trees and hedges, and the first tree the farmer has picked is the ash tree because it's good for firewood. Um, but I particularly want a thorn tree in every hedge. And as I said, it is, so it has the base, but it can have some of the, bio, the canopy value, not all uh, as much as you won't have as much flowers on the farm with this kind of a hedge. So therefore, we want both types of hedges on every farm. Uh, the top hedge is then, so the one on the left in Grange there, you can see the new, new shrub only been left in recent years, but coming on grand. And again, a super one on, on the top right coming down then to the bad ones on the bottom and um, that hedge on the bottom left hand side it is doing a stock proofing job because it's on top of the bank it's a small fringe no bird will nest in that hedge because the birds the, the birds of prey will get at it from the top the fox will get at it from the bottom there is no flowers on that hedge there will be no fruit on that hedge and that unfortunately is a lot of our hedges the one on the left however even worse is the one on the bottom right um, where it was an escaped hedge 
and was this is what happened to most of our hedges in the 40 years ago. They would have been all those escaped tree line hedges. If there was ever a gap in the hedge, the farmers always cut it at the base. When we got the machines 40, 50 years ago, they cut it at the one, you know, one and a half, one, one and a half meters high. And you can see what's happening there. It's been cut to the same level every year and gradually dying out. So that's the worst situation. And it's only it's a really good time of the year to be talking about this because it's in the next two months, probably when most people aren't out in the fields, is the only time the hedge looks bad. That hedge will look grand for 10 months of the year because the vegetation will grow up and there'll be some kind of greenery there and you'll say that's a grand hedge. So for the top hedges then, we want to side trim from a wide base uh, to a triangular profile to get the light at the base, keep it growing where we want it. We must cut the growing point to prevent it escaping. Leave the peak as high as possible, but at least one and a half meters, because we know birds don't nest in the below that, above the ground level, including the bank if present, and retain occasional thorn trees and saplings um, to, to, uh, to allow flowering and fruiting. Cut little and often, um, you know, the, again, we learned the lesson in reps. We left them for five years and then they were they were cut. Uh, you know, it was it, it was really rough cutting then. And we still didn't get much flowers and fruit in a five year old growth. You need the old mature thorn tree to give you the buckets of fruit. So, again, uh, landscape, we wouldn't would, would be fairly familiar. And we're saying we have great hedges, but there are just to be very clear. There are no flowers and no fruit in that kind of a, a landscape of hedges. Um, yeah, so our, yeah, again, what is what our clear message is, what we need on every farm is to have some escaped hedges, some, some top hedges. And again, the elephant in the room is there's no point in talking, as I have been for many, many years about hedges, but ignoring the fact that the, 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 the farm hasn't got any or has only, you know, 100 acre fields. So the average field size is the elephant in the room also for, for hedges. It, it, it's, a, it's a back of the envelope job for working out uh, the quantity of hedges. So with quantity and quality is what we want, irrespective of what, what, uh, um, what we want out of the hedge. So just quickly to run through the acres hedge actions, and um, there's good money there for planting and laying and uh, coppicing. So I'll just run through those. And there's a the fourth, the third one, fourth one then, which is really important, I suppose, it's a start to kind of address general um, hedgerow management um, for in acres. So there is no requirement, it's clearly said there's no requirement to cut uh, hedges in acres parcels. However, if, they're being, if they are being managed by cutting during the course of the contract, uh, for the, these are for this specific um, where you choose an action. Um, but it's stark because they're the ones that the farmer is getting money for acres. If existing hedges are greater than one and a half metres in height, cutting or trimming is per permitted, provided they are not cut below the 1.5 metres. Now, I would rather, if that was said, not cut at all, not topped at all. Um, because again, to me, that's a little bit confusing. If existing hedges are less than 1.5 metres, do not cut or trim. So the whole idea is to get them up and up and up. Now, we'll, we'll see later. I prefer to maybe again let them up gradually each year but look it's not bad we just need to give those hedges a chance to to, to recover okay so and there the the actions if the farmers pick these in 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 acres at least there is some look at the hedgerow management alongside it for planting then um farmers are get can get huge money for planting 750 meters at 529 per meter per year for five years um and again, the detail is all there. I won't go into it in too much. But in my my view, uh, the most important thing there is on day one uh, to, to decide when you're plan planning to plant a hedge, whether whether you're planning an escaped or a chopped hedge. And now you understand what I'm saying there, because the biggest problem is people often plant it, don't top it. And then when it comes to the top of the wire, they say, oh, I must cut the hedge and then turn it into a, an upside down tallish bush hedge. Um, the, the, the acres insists on uh, native species, which is fantastic because native species are good for other native species. It also insists on Irish provenance, which is absolutely critical for biodiversity. We can import a white thorn from another country, but it may flower or fruit at a different time and may confuse the, the associated biodiversity. So we need native species of Irish provenance from a biodiversity point of view. 
um, may not be as important for the carbon. So planting a new escaped hedge, it's as simple as you can choose any mix of the tree and hedge species. Obviously, you're not going to put a, a huge amount of the very big oaks and uh, but you can you can go to any of the species because they can grow away and uh, they're not pruned after planting. We're not able to use the compostable film, but that's fine um, as long as there's some little manual that the, it doesn't matter how slow it is growing, as long as it just keeps ahead of the grass, never to top it. That's the point. Never to top it because um, it is. Um, yeah, now, to decide on day one that you're never going to top it. If not, if you want the topped hedge, um, you must tolerate, choose hedge species that tolerate trimming and thrive on trimming, like the thorns. So you plan for an occasional white thorn tree um, and include a small number of additional tree species. Protect these occasional trees with a tree guard. Do not prune or ever top. And then you prune all the other plants after planting. So these are beautiful hedging species that thrive on, with the thorns thrive on, on, on topping. Um, and again, uh, the, the gelder rose, spindle, hazel, they are, they are, they are, they are good within the hedge. The climbers are also good. Again, I worry about planting these because often people go to buy dog rose and in a garden centre, they'll be given the invasive, um, a different Rosa, Rosa rugosa with the huge big ones. So we need to be very careful about when we're putting things out in the countryside that we're not doing more harm than good. There's one thing worse than not doing anything, it's doing something wrong from a biodiversity point of view. The larger trees then are not suitable within the hedges, except maybe one every, you know, very, very occasional. Um, again, they often get thrown into a hedge and then chopped and then destroy the hedge, especially these kind of ones. You will often find, um, you know, a, 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 a bunch of, of um, hedging, including lots of these. And then when they're topped, they, they, don't, they go nowhere. They turn into, you know, a, an awful mess. So whereas in the escaped hedge, you could do. So again, just briefly to go through the, the top hedge, if you want a top hedge, you, you, you line it out, you're very careful, keep your plants from drying out. You dig your trench, you plant five per meter in a double staggered row. That's the, the last recommendation. Um, and then you put on your tree guard on your occasional thorn trees and other trees. Um, but again, we don't want too many in the top hedge. We just want a nice amount um, maybe one every 10 metres at the start in the new hedge. Then in this case, we were using the old silage plastic. Now we're using compostable film, um, but you basically have a strip and a good wide strip and you push it down over the plants, push in the sides or put gravel on top of it. And um, then there's our, our uh, the start of our lovely hedge. And you can see on the right hand side, again, it's very hard to get good pictures. But instead of the one there, there's a big bunch of five or six stems that's, you know, a year later we uh, coming through the compostable film there. And there are two uh, people supplying compostable film. So I think it's something we really need to push. I've been using silage plastic for years and my colleagues used to say that's not good. It got good hedges. Um, but obviously the compostable film is, is um, more environmentally friendly. So you can see here what happens. Your first one goes into five and then the next year you come back down, you cut it there. It's not a race to the top. And there then there'll be five there, there'll be 25 and you won't get into the hedge after a year or two. And then you fence as appropriate. Coppicing in acres um, it means cutting it back down to the ground. You can see now where you don't want to be coppicing. Um, there's a reasonable payment for it. It's critical that appropriate hedges are selected. And again, we need people before they do any hedge management to understand um, because otherwise we can destroy biodiversity and reduce carbon. Uh, old wire, very dangerous in hedges, and that can be a problem. So to me, that kind of a hedge, you know, it's too valuable from biodiversity. And I assume Car um, Lillian may have a comment on carbon afterwards on the two types of hedges. But like, it's it's just, to me anyway, that's too valuable. I would fence that off and leave it alone. Um, but it's, I wouldn't cut coppice it. But what would be, what has happened in the past, it's been cut half the way up at two meters high and you can see that's the absolute worst thing to do if you were to cut it at ground level it could rejuvenate but you're still a lot of gaps and as i said it's too valuable similarly here this is just beautiful this is the one that will be on the postcard of ireland and um, so i would leave these alone i would fence them off if if you're trying to retain them for longer and then the seeds will come and they'll naturally regenerate um, 
these are the ones I would love to coppice, which is a lot of the top hedges in the country that are not great. Um, I don't think they're good for, for, for carbon. They're certainly not good for biodiversity. This is the upside down toilet to brush edge. And even at this stage, it's a bit of greenery on it there. It doesn't look too bad. But this is the one to me I would love. And especially a good one like this one that has a stump every meter. So you can still get down and you'll have a mighty hedge and then you layer that up from, from now on. So that's what we mean by coppicing. Um, and that is what we don't mean by coppicing. And that is what, you know, um, that's what are we doing there? We're doing nothing. You know, we're doing neither. It's neither left alone or it was cut too high. No infilling was done. I would prefer to coppice ones that will end up being a good job. So there's a big worry about, um, you know, bringing down those escaped hedges. They're just, you know, amazing. The hedge laying then um, is a beautiful skill, uh, hand, very hand, uh, hand, a, a lovely, lovely skill to do. But the most important, the big danger here is that diggers or heavy machinery are not used to bash the hedge. Uh, hedges survive despite what we do to them, not because of it. So this is the pure skill of, of hedge laying here. Beautiful job. And it's well paid in acres and done right. It's a superb job again. Um, so that's the laying. Um, lovely jobs there so i suppose my message is that we need both types of hedges on every farm we need our escaped hedges and we need some top hedges but most importantly we need both managed um appropriately and again i i'm talking from the biodiversity point of view but from everything i've heard from lillian we want things growing actively and bulky and bigger and everything she can comment afterwards but um i think we're you know we're we're not too far so again coming back to our our three messages we need to we for every time anybody ever mentions hedges in ireland we need to be thinking which are we talking about we could we could have 20 pictures but they fall into two categories one that are, have escaped and ones that are topped and we don't ever top the escaped hedges and we don't let the top hedges escape when planting hedges decide which are which you want and i would love to coppice the upside down toilet brush hedges in ireland um, and we would have huge quality quality there in the future so garamahagi Thank you very much, Catherine. Again, brilliant. It's always, always very educational. Listen to you talk about about hedges. It's, it's it opens my eyes every time. Um, I'm going to hand over to John now, my colleague John, who has a list of questions that have came in through the Q and A tab. Um, some of them have been answered directly by our by our speakers, but we'll endeavour to get to everything there now. And I will allow Catherine and and Dale to to answer as many as possible for the next fifteen or twenty minutes. So, over to you, John. Yeah. Thanks, Declan. Thanks, uh, Catherine and Dale. Um. I suppose there's some questions here, um, and they they may well be addressed later later by later presentations. So um, we'll just we'll work through the ones here, um, relevant to Catherine and Dale for the minute. I suppose Dale for yourself, what are the main barriers hindering the move towards um, the use of protected or protected area? Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Um, clearly, look, that's an issue um, that we need to work through. Um, at a, at a government and an industry level. Um, because if the product is not there for farmers to buy, well, then we have an issue. Now, I think the reality is if we set a clear direction of travel, uh, and I think we've done that so far, and I think if we update that then in the in the soon to be published climate action plan, uh, it was just us discussed extensively in the food, vision, beef group uh, and the dairy group, where the focus was on um to 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 deliver that you know adoption of protected urea as much as possible by 2025 because it gave us gave us a win so we need to then go to the fertilizer industry and say well look this is what ireland wants and this is what ireland needs in the context of agri-food sector and, and and when we do that i'm confident the market will be able to supply us with the quantity of, of fertilizer that we need you've got to remember we're a tiny fraction of the overall fertilizer industry globally and um, so i'm very confident that that will work its way through good stuff and uh, i suppose is there is there other procurement issues sort of for for, for other things um that, that might be hindering sort of the implementation of of these sort of emission reducing 
practices as well. Yeah, well, look, there, there, there has been some anecdotal evidence there, you know, in terms of low emission slurry spreading, and 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 because farmers have really adopted that as a as a measure and an action on their farm, we've really seen, you know, the 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 growth rates have been quite spectacular, you know, over the last couple of years, and that's that's all credit to the farmers out there on the ground who are listening to the advice of their advisors and getting on and, and doing it. But I did hear, you know, anecdotally that, you know, the, the machine manufacturers were struggling to keep up with supply. So again, we just have to work through that in a, in a very practical way. You know, we, there's, there's been a war going on in the world and, um, you know, raw materials, um, you know, have been hard to source in some in some cases. So again, we need to just kind of, you know, look at that and see what we can do to take that forward. But generally speaking, I think, you know, in terms of clover, multi-species swords, um, you know, the availability of seed has been quite good and we've been able to get on to do that. But as for more and more farmers ramp up and adopt these technologies, well, then we have to ensure that the industry is able to respond to that, that increased demand. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Dale. Um, and then another one for you. Just, um, what are what are the penalties for 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 missing um emission reduction targets? I suppose if it and if it's clear by by twenty twenty four that the target is is going to be missed, what what happens? Sure. So within the Climate Act, um, it, it's very clear in that it states we we need to take every you know every measure in so far as practical to 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 deliver on our carbon budgets. But if we get to a stage where it looks like we're going to come up short, well then your your shortfall, if you like, is carried forward into the next carbon budget period. So any shortfall in carbon budget period one twenty one to twenty five will be carried forward into twenty six to thirty. Ultimately, if we don't meet our carbon reduction targets by 2030, well, then we could be open to legal challenge, um, you know, from, from any, any, any sector of society that would want to take a case. So, look, that's looking at this from a very negative point of view. We know what we need to do. We need to get on and do it. I think that that early action is absolutely critical. We can't wait to 2024, 2025, or 2028, 2029. We need to get on now and adopt every action we possibly can on our farms, and um, because that's the only way we're going to be be successful in achieving these reductions. Good stuff. Thanks, Dale. Um, there's a good many questions in here for yourself, Catherine. Um, a lot of positive comments about about your presentation as well. Um, I suppose just maybe to kick off, um. I suppose, what do you see as being the main challenges to um, maintaining hedgerows? I suppose education and people knowing nobody's deliberately doing the wrong job. So it's just getting sim. And I mean, I've been talking about it for 30 years and I probably haven't been very effective. So maybe we that's why I'm trying to hone it into very simple messages now, do you know, because it, it can be confusing and then you have extremes on both sides you know we don't cut edges at all and we need to cut them so education is the thing and the public the general public um i, I often talk about um the most um negative comments i hear from my elderly uh relatives in the car talking about isn't that a lovely neat job <laughs> i have to bite my tongue do you know what i mean yeah. so it's it's the general public need to appreciate that we need what we need and that neatness and tidiness in every aspect of biodiversity is not good. Yeah, and then I suppose biodiversity aside, um, sort of from a from a carbon sequestration point of view, um, is there any sort of studies or literature um regarding which I'm species sure. sequester more Does carbon? Does Lillian want there? to comment at this stage? Um, on the carbon side, because I haven't particularly touched on it. I, she is the expert. Sure, um, I can do. Thanks, Catherine. So um, I've been involved in a piece of work. I'll mention it um, later on in my own presentation. Um, but I noticed there was a question in, in terms of species and are species different, for example, in terms of um, carbon. But I suppose in the first instance, uh, you know, all of the biomass that we measured, the dry biomass, carbon concentration was consistent so it was all uh, around the 44 percent you know and that's somewhere you know close to to international um averages with that and um, but i suppose from the carbon sequestration point of view 
the only difference that it might play would be more specifically related to the growth rate. So the speed at which biomass accumulates. Um, so I suppose some species of trees will grow faster than others. And that's when you would be accumulating more biomass, i.e. sequestering more carbon more rapidly. Now, ours was a relatively short project. So the scope of what we could do in our aims um, weren't to, I suppose, discriminate at the level of species. We were more trying to see, can we develop a method to assess uh, carbon stock change over time for the national inventory? But there was work done by Matthew Axe in the UK. And similarly, he found that he, he did uh, distinguish between species. He found that the differences were insufficient to want the exploration. Uh, you know, it takes so much effort to, you know, measure every single species separately. Now, I would say that our forestry colleagues and people who work um, more directly in terms of species and, and trees and so forth uh, would probably be able to add more to that discussion. But in terms of the hedgerows, um, you know, Axe in his studies in the UK found a similar, um, you know, and proposed a similar thing that the additional effort associated with um, species um, distinguishing um, research in terms of inventories and stuff is is not, if you like, worth it or it's it's negligible at that scale. Yeah, brilliant. Um, thanks, Lillian. Um, Catherine, someone's just commented here. Um, you talked about the the top and height of of your of your hedgerow um, in in acres. Um, I think you'd mentioned it was one point five meters, but then your uh, yeah, PowerPoint I, had said one point eight. I saw that comment, and thanks for giving me the chance to. I suppose the evidence in the past would be that anything below one point five is bad, right? Now, acres is aiming to get it up to one point eight. And it's certainly, I think, with the question again was, do we bring them down to 1.8? And that's my biggest fear. We should, you know, this is where we need to, do, we cannot talk about hedges without deciding which hedge are we talking about. So for the top hedge, bring it up as high as the uh, hedge cutter can cut the top. So that's up to maybe 15 foot, depending on each site. So the bigger and bulkier, the better. Um, so the, uh, yeah, the absolute minimum is 1.5. And Acres is aiming for a minimum of, of 1.8 for the top edges, and that should never be related to the escaped edges. Brilliant, thanks, Catherine. Um, and then just another one there. Um, does compostable film produce microplastics? Um, is there alternatives to compostable film or, or plastic for weed control? I understand the compostable film is is is. Is, is okay. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert, but that's moved on now from the degradable film. If you, you know, the one the maze has to yeah. use from now on, that is what they're making this new compostable film from. I understand it's, it's, it's all approved. It's what we use in the bags in the, the shed, in the, in the, in the shops. Maybe. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not an expert, but I believe it's the, it's, it's exactly what we want it to be at the moment. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and then I suppose just on, on, on chip mulch, are there are there extra payments for the use of chip mulch um, to help hedges establish? Um, no, and I would be totally for them. It's just, I suppose, in my experience that the only you don't these it's uh, everything is great, but it's not going to be available and accessible to every farmer. I'd like to talk about the sheep's wool. The Cumbria farmers are going to give me sheep's wool to put on, on the hedges and try that out. I'd love if it worked. Now, will it be suitable for every farmer in the country? Uh, you know, that's so the, back to the what's practical and what's good. Anything that keeps the light out is good. Your carpet, your cardboard, whatever. But, you know, I suppose when we're pushing out a big message, we have to keep it very simple and uh, for everybody. But absolutely anything will do that keeps the light out. Brilliant. Um, is is the hedging supposed to be cut back to six metres or can it go beyond six metres in terms I, of acres? Do they mean six six inches, I'd say? I know I saw that one. I presume they mean cutting it down to the ground for the... for the Yeah, yeah. again, we're talking best practice here. If you want your top hedge um, down to an inch below the ground, above the ground, you know, the lower... You, wherever you cut it, it will... It will um, it will, although maybe they're talking about six meter high. No, they're not. Yeah, sorry, I'm I misunderstood. I think that they're talking about the cutting of the, the uh, below the ground there. I think it's six inches, or I'd be down to an inch as low as low as you can, as long as the the compostable film will push over it and and uh, hold, it'll hold the film you're putting over it. Yeah, um, and then I suppose the be the best the best hedge and type for biodiversity and and, and acres. 
um, from the options available, I suppose. Uh, if, uh, for new planting, I suppose, and going back to, to the, the last comment about the species, you see, we need to just, what, the existing hedges, we have what we have, and we shouldn't get hung up on what species are there or whatever. Um, they all can all be good. For the new hedges, um, yeah, going back to, you know, we need something that works. They're all good. A mixture is good, but only if they're managed right. So, um, look, they're going to be white thorn and, and the new acres even changed to 85% now can be one species. So I would be very happy with 85% white thorn plus a scattering of others, suitable species that are looked after then in the hedge. Yeah, that's great. Um then another one on the hedgerows, Catherine, um, is not cutting hedges at all best practice for carbon sequestration. Um, by, okay, well, that's a really good angle. one now for, for Lillian. Um, you know, for my two types of hedges, um, or do we leave them all go totally free from a carbon point of view? So I suppose, um, yeah, as you've been saying, Catherine, bigger and bulkier is better, but hedgerows are a managed, um, they are a managed feature in our agricultural landscapes. Um, I would say that rather than, um, you know, abandoning management, um, it's talking about adjusting management to be less intensive, I would say. And also, if you have, if you're cutting every year, can we adjust this to being a rotation across the farm to give opportunity to allow space for these hedgerows to accumulate more biomass? Um, but, you know, as, as Catherine's been pointing out, we do have these two very different types of hedgerows and they do have benefits for different things as well. If you think about the density of those um, topped, um, more managed heads, hedges, like on aggregate, those have less benefit, I suppose, climatically because they are a smaller stock, etc. But we do need all of these for the bigger picture in terms of carbon, in terms of water quality, in terms of um, habitat for biodiversity and so forth. Um, so I suppose, especially in the very intensive ones, I would say it's really about trying to see, can we find a different management strategy and pull pull back on that? Um, uh, because, you know, if they are topped uh, very much to the same size every year if they're flailed and topped to the same size every year they're not actually accumulating biomass which means they're not actually gaining at all so i think there's a way to find a happy medium there um uh, with that as well absolutely thanks lillian and then i suppose just following on from that will will hedgerow maintenance ever become uh, an, an smr sort of under under cross compliance um, well, I suppose it's it's hedgerow management isn't there yet, um, I, I, other than the timing of the year. But again, there's worse things done. It's bad to cut them in the summer, obviously, but, it, you know, it, 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 bad management is just as bad. I, what, what's encouraging now is that hedges are being protected under space for nature. Farmers are getting more credit for having them. Um, they're, you know, under, under the eco schemes, if you have 4% or 7% or 10% of space for nature, which predominantly is hedges in this country. So at least there's a, a recognition there. There's also protection about removing them under, uh, under landscape features as, a, you know, you have to replace them. The actual management isn't there yet, but look, all the, it's all moving in the one direction. It's quantity and quality. Um, and I would, yeah, that's where it's, it's heading towards. That's brilliant. Thanks, Catherine. Um, there's just one more has come in there for deal. Um, why is the DAFM policy only only for a small AD program? Um, I think uh, in the Climate Action Plan 2021, there was a commitment there to develop 1.6 terawatt hours. Uh, back in the summer, when the sectoral emission ceiling was was um, was agreed. Um, Minister Ryan and Minister McConnell agreed to look specifically at the area of anaerobic digestion in terms of ramping that up, ramping up the ambition. And I think um, that's something that will be covered in the Climate Action Plan 2023 that will be published over the next couple of weeks. So I'll just leave it at that. That's brilliant. Thanks, Dale. Um, just to say that the, the slides will be circulated um to everyone on the call today just to, to answer that question and, and this recording will be available and we'll include a link to that as well. Um, 
I suppose that's it for now. There's a few questions there just about carbon sequestration, but they'll probably be answered as we go along. Um, so stay stay tuned um, and I'll hand these back over to Declan. And thanks to Catherine Dale and, and Lillian for, for chipping in there. Super. Thank you very much, John. And thanks to Dale and Catherine for both the presentations and for the honest answers as, as, good, as, as good as we could give them. So um, for the next part of the seminar, I'm going to actually hand over to Noel Feeney, who is the president of the Agricultural Consultants Association. And Noel is going to chair the panel discussion and and I let him explain and, and introduce all the rest of the panelists within the panel discussion. So Noel, over to you. Thank you very much, Declan. You can hear me clearly. Yep, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Thanks very much. And good morning to everyone. Good morning to everyone that's joined in. And um, thanks very much, um, Declan, yourself and your colleagues for the invite to moderate um, this discussion. Um, it was very interesting there listening to Dale and to Catherine, uh, the first two topics there. And again, you know, Dale, especially coming from the point of view of where it's all started, um, you know, what the requirement is through legislation and maybe, you know, mitigation actions that's required. And Catherine, then, of course, the old topic of discussing hedgerow management. And I suppose Catherine and myself as soldiers since the start of reps back in the early 90s in our different roles, um, you know, talking about hedgerow management and planting hedges and crops and hedges. And that hasn't gone away and it's becoming more important as we're learning. So, you know, a lot of a lot of these actions and a lot of these requirements are basically, you know, going to fall down to um, farmers. On, in the ground on their farms to adopt these new technologies, adopt these new practices. It's a new way of farming and also it's down to our advisory services, both private and public, to deliver this at the coal face to farmers. So again, it's important that all the knowledge um, is passed on um, as soon as possible and where possible to the right people and needs to be obviously properly resourced as well as that because at the end of the day, delivering the message to the farmers is going to be the key to the success. So for um, this part of the um, webinar, we're going to have a panel discussion. And what I will do first is I'll just generally um, introduce our three speakers. And we will introduce Geraldine O'Sullivan from the Irish Farmers Association. And Geraldine is a senior policy executive for the environment and forestry at the Irish Farmers Association and the program manager for the on-farm resource efficiency initiative, Smart Farming. And she has a particular interest in the transformational role that agriculture and forests can play in meeting um, the climate change challenges, which we've briefly discussed earlier on. And the Irish Farmers Association, as everyone knows, has um, for a number of years um, publicised our smart farming policy with different meetings and informational meetings all over the country. Our other speakers then will be Lillian O'Sullivan from Chagas Soil Health, and she's a research officer in the Environment, Soils and Land Use Department of Chagas based at Johnstow Castle County, Wexford. And her research interests include sustainable soils and land use and the understanding of how soils are part of a larger system. Exploring land use with respect to climate and environment objectives is an important aspect of her work. And her methodological toolkit includes spatial analysis and in reduction in relation to soils in Ireland. And again, very important as well from what we heard earlier on. And finally, our other speaker will be Dr. Doug McMillan. And um, Doug is an environmental scientist and chair of the Green Restoration Ireland Cooperative and Project Manager of the Farm Carbon EIP. So those will be our panel speakers. And of course, um, people are also invited into um, typing any questions they may have. So look at uh, Geraldine, I'll um, introduce, let you go ahead first and you can give your presentation to us, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Noel, uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks to the National Rural Network for the invitation to speak here this morning. Um, as we continue today's discussion on soil health and carbon, it's important to note that soils host more than 25% of all biodiversity on the planet. They're very much the foundation of the food chains that nourish us and the plants and the animals that we produce. As Lily will go into, healthy soils are also the largest land-based carbon pool on the planet. And this coupled with their sponge-like ability um, to absorb water, they can help to reduce flooding and drought. And really, they are indispensable alloy for climate change mitigation and adaption. And that's very much at the heart of the Smart Farming program. We recognize that soils are, are probably one of the most important assets other than the farmer himself on a farm. 
just to briefly go through the Smart Farming Programme, uh, it's a voluntary resource efficiency programme. Um, it's delivered by IFA uh, in partnership with the Environmental Protection Agency, and it identifies soils and soil fertility as one of its eight thematic areas that offer the greatest savings to farmers. The other thematic areas covered by the programme are grassland management, feed, inputs and waste, water, energy, time management and machinery. Since it launched in 2013, it has carried out more than 200 on-farm resource assessments on all farm types in nearly every county in Ireland. I think we're just missing one county with the aim to improve uh, farm resource management, reduce farm waste, reduce farm input costs and have a positive impact on the environment. So the resource efficiency ass assessment, which is carried out on farms, is very much the cornerstone of the programme. And with that, an agronomist will go out uh, and meet with the farmer, looking at the eight thematic areas and will help the farmer in consultation look to see what practical actions could be taken to improve resource efficiency under the, under the areas highlighted or discussed before. So they'll go through that at the visit and following the visit and discussions with the farmer, a report is produced on the actions that are recommended by the agronomist and the cost savings that are associated. So if the farmer implements those actions, what are the cost savings associated with those recommendations, as well as the greenhouse gas reduction potential? So consistently improving soil fertility and grassland management offers farmers the greatest savings. If we look to the 2021 results, the average cost savings identified on farms was 5,400. The cost savings associated with soil fertility and grassland man management accounted for 62% of these savings, with improving soil fertility uh, saving 1,152, while improving grassland management delivered savings of 2,196. So we see here uh, the potential that improving the soil health will have um, in, in relation to production and grass and the savings that can be achieved. So really, what are healthy soils? Soils are defined um, are the ability to function and to sustain plants and animals as part of the ecosystem. There are five main factors that impact soil health. That's soil structure, soil chemistry, organic matter content, soil biology, um, and water inf infiltration, retention, and movement through the profile. So in particular, soil chemistry, the soil pH, and the soil organic matter are very important as they regulate nutrient availability and delivery of different soil functions, including, including carbon sequestration, and I said the nutrient cycling. So within the program, there are a number of actions that are recommended and typically the first step is if, if a farmer isn't doing it already, it's recommended to test their soils. Approximately 90% of the soil sampled in Ireland are lacking either phosphorus, potassium or lime, and this is limiting the production potential. Uh, basically, if you don't know the nutrients that are in your soil, then you don't know how much extra nutrients they may need. So a, to a soil test report shows the index ranking of the soils from one to four, one being the lowest in fertility and four being the highest. Within then, following on from that, we look at the soil pH and the liming. The pH status of a soil plays an important role in grass production as nutrients only become available to grass at certain pH levels. So correcting the soil pH through liming increases the availability and efficiency of the applied fertilizers, be, there, be them inorganic or organic manures. From the program and the teachings of the learnings of the program is that money spent on lime is one of the, uh, the best investments a farmer can make in relation to Im improving their soil. So the one the, the other step we'll go through is knowing what your soil nutrients. So if you don't know about your soil fertility, you may be spreading uh, fertilizers and wasting money unnecessarily. So we look at the nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the most important nutrients for plant growth, as we know, and crop production. However, when applied to soils of low fertility, the recovery of nitrogen fertilizer um, can be diminished. For phosphorus, another important soil nutrient is important for crop establishment and root development and also plays an important role in nutrition for livestock. 
Phosphorus is central to driving fast and efficient grass growth. Phosphorus is very important in receded fields to achieve good grass establishment. While potassium increases stem strength, improves drought resistance, cold tolerance and increases yield. Potassium is very important in silage fields. And finally, sulfur. Sulfur is an important nutrient for grassland and is associated with nitrogen uptake and efficiency and can help to maintain crude protein. So once we have this information about the, the soil testing and the nutrients within the soils, we would look to see develop a tailored nutrient management plan. So really the nutrient management plan is offering advice on the four ores, using the right product at the right rate, at the right time and in the right place. So that's very much where the nutrient plan is looking at. So we're following on now. We have our soil test. We have our crop requirements. And now we look at the manure and slurry requirements. And then if we need additional fertilizer, top up is needed. So we all know the cattle slurry is a valuable source of nutrients. So we would encourage in the program that the slurry is tested to determine the nutrient content and to help match the slurry application rates to crop requirements. Ideally, we you know this should be applied in the spring because this maximizes the uptake of, of the, sl the nitrogen in the slurry. Also, it's encouraged that uh, to use low emission slurry for spreading. This helps to increase again nitrogen uptake. And also, as we're talking here, it, it reduces uh, emissions uh, from, from agriculture and losses of nitrogen to the atmosphere. As, as there was a discussion on earlier, it's encouraged that farmers have switched to protected urea. We, you know, extensive field and farm based trials have shown that the level of grass production is maintained with protected urea. And it also has the added benefit of reducing ammonia and nitrous oxide which help to reduce the impact on both air and water quality and also reduce our emissions, particularly our nitrous oxide emissions. So if we're looking at our soils and we're looking at ways to increase the carbon sequestration, which is the process of capturing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it in our soils, under the programme, it's recommended to apply slurry and manure to grassland because this helps to replenish organic soil matter levels and increase carbon storage. Again, improving the soil fertility levels and improving grass productivity, both will increase the carbon storage and increase the carbon sequestration um, within the grassroot zone. As was briefly touched on as well, planting more diverse uh, grassland swards, incorporating clover or deep rooted species such as plantain or chicory into the swards. Again, they increase the storage, cap storage cap capacity of the soil and also the deep rooting species help to reduce nitrogen leaching um, and, and will have a benefit for water quality. Minimizing soil disturbance is recommended during receding, and that just helps to protect the carbon stores in already in the soil and also to try to prevent poaching on soil surfaces to maintain the, the soil, the carbon stored within the, 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 the soils already. So it's very much a practical based program looking at actions um, within which a farmer can predominantly driven by reducing costs and then improving the resource efficiency, but it will have multiple benefits by increasing carbon storage and also improving water quality. What I've gone through here this morning briefly is, is, is available, all the information on the Smart Farming website. There's a soil fertility guidance note that goes through all of this. And there's also a number of short videos on carbon sequestration in soils and improving soil fertility that are available. So look, um, I'm going to finish there, Noel. Um, thanks to everyone for listening and for your time. And I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, um, Geraldine. Um, yeah, a couple of things struck me there, uh, you know, basically at the, at the start of it. The, big, the, the biggest assets we have are our own, our soils and the farmer that's managing them. And, you know, over the years, um, you know, as my role as a farm advisor, again, going back to the, you know, the, when REP started in the early 90s um, with those new environmental schemes continuing on to where we are now going into acres, you know, um, the whole issue of soil sampling um, has come into has come into fore because, you know, not too many people would have soil sampled to that unless they were fairly intensive farmers. So there is a requirement there, Geraldine, throughout a lot of these environmental schemes now that farmers do carry out soil sampling. And then obviously, 
you know, from we would have maybe at any one time, maybe 50, 60,000 farmers in environmental schemes. So there are 50 or 60,000 requirements for soil sampling and you have maybe two or 3,000 in organic farming. But obviously we have over 130,000 farmers in the country. And I know more commercial ones will be doing soil sampling because as you rightly and correctly say there, um, especially in the last couple of years um, with inputs and everything else. So again, it's getting, I think the message has to get out there that more farmers, all farmers, should be taking soil samples. Yeah, no, look, absolutely, Noel. And, and we see this and, and we're, we're looking at as we start into phase two of this, you know, there's lots of farmers out there that are hitting all the boxes and we want, you know, it's more about showing what you're doing and, uh, you know, uh, what the steps are to ensuring that you're getting the most out of your soils uh, and the first step is and, and you know I suppose we're, we're looking at the program to try and get those that aren't doing that you know there's so many as you said that are now doing it um but it's to, to try and, and and you know kind of have it a standard practice for everyone not just in the schemes because there is a huge cost saving benefit to it um, and, you know, just to see the value in that, as I said, 20 percent of the savings of just improving soil fertility. So by doing those tests and applying it right, there's just multiple benefits uh, within the grass production. Um, and as you, just to get that message out there and, and to encourage all farmers to do it. So I'd absolutely agree with you, Noel. Yeah, that's and that's I mean, you know what the, the, the cost savings that you mentioned there are nearly five and a half thousand on particular farms like it's in this day and age, it's, it's quite um, important. You know, it's 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 a huge it's a huge saving and, you know, liming, of course, and we will have, you know, an option for liming um, in the new eco schemes as well. But maybe it's something that should be promoted on a more wider on a more wider platform as well, because we all know the benefits of liming and correcting soil pH and allowing all the different biological and chemical um, actions to take place within the soil as well for grassroots establishment. You know, so again, you know, the lime, the liming message is still a very important one out there as well, Geraldine. Yeah, and look, we see we see with the climate targets and the reduction in chemical fertilizer there, you know, and you know, and proposals to continue. It's so important that. Um, we just, you know, use all these tools that we have to reduce our requirements because there is a concern there that production is going to be impacted, you know, but we just have to, you know, and we have it from a water quality perspective as well. So if we can just use the tools, the soil testing, the liming and getting our soils up to a level, um, we will we will see both the reduction in cost, but also the sector um, reducing its requirements, you know, and obviously maximizing the use of the organic um, fertilizers as well is key to that and getting them out early um, to, to, to reduce our reliance on it. Um, but all of these would be hugely helpful in, in meeting the targets. Um, but, you know, sometimes we kind of jump to step three and, and that's what we're learning as well. And there can be issues where you haven't got your pH right or you have, you know, you don't know what's going on. And there are issues then with the establishment of even the multi-species swords. So kind of taking the stepped approach and doing each of them are so important to the other measures working and not affecting the production. Geraldine, thanks very much. I think that message is loud and clear. It's it's basics. It's basics, really. Yeah. And it's improving our knowledge of why we need to do the basics right. Um, I'll move on. We probably have more questions for you, Jordan, later on, but I'm just conscious of time. So, Lillian, we'll move on to yourself for your bit of a discussion there regarding um, soil health and the work you're doing there within Chagas. Thanks, Lillian. Very good. And thank you very much for uh, the introduction. Can you see my slide OK? We have a Lillian, yes. Oh, yep. brilliant. OK, great. So I'll press on. So a lot of what uh, I'm going to say, much of it has already been said um, this morning uh, with the different speakers. And uh, again, you know, a lot of what Geraldine has just, um, you know, spoken about in her uh, presentation, you know, it very much aligns and resonates with the work, of course, that we've been doing in Chagas to try and um, promote the whole area of soil and the role of soil to under pin the delivery of not just production but also all of these other ecosystem services. So I'm going to focus a little bit on um, just what research I suppose uh, or some of the research that's going on. Um, okay I'll just oh we're not moving <laughs> the slide isn't 
Oh, there we go. So again, Geraldine already gave the definition of what soil health is. Um, so it's that continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals and humans. And, um, you know, I suppose most people who are interested in the space will know that now we have, uh, you know, targets in terms of a soil strategy for 2030 and as well we see this massive commitment now at EU scale for the first time by having a mission in the area of soil health and food which is a huge huge evolution in terms of soil in terms of being a priority and uh, I suppose the big issue there is that you know the the outlook in terms of the resource and, and soil as a resource uh, we've quite a bit of work to do in terms of um, reversing the trends that we see in terms of uh, degradation. And, uh, you know, we have an ambition for 75% of soils to be healthy uh, by 2030. So there's a lot of different research, um, the sort of stuff Geraldine has spoken about. Um, but also, you know, TAGS are involved in a large programme, the European Joint Programme on Soils. And in that, we will be further developing and fostering tools for sustainable food production Production, and of course, looking at how soil management can sustain biodiversity and soil functions. Um, I just wanted to mention this. We had a, a nationwide um, piece of research before the Square Project, the Soil Quality Assessment Research uh, Project. And, you know, I suppose there are so many different functions that we rely on or we rely on the soil to deliver for us. Um, you know, in addition to primary productivity, you know, we also rely on soil for to purify water, but also to regulate water across our lands. We know we have an urgent requirement to utilise or harness the potential of soil to sequester and store carbon. Um, but of course, we need soil for the biodiversity, so much of which is an unknown entity still. It's a big area of um, exploration for us because, of course, if we can, as Geraldine rightly points out, you know, move towards enhancing the biological functioning of our soils, that can support um, a reduction in the need for exploration external, um, you know, chemical fertilizers. And these are all things that are being set out for us in our sector um, to do. So this is where we need to really look at the soil and explore its potential in, in those areas. And also, of course, to be able to cycle nutrients. So there are, you know, elements like structure, some of the physical indicators that are very important in terms of mediating these different services. But it's interesting that the biological indicators were very uh, sensitive, I suppose, and being able to um, being able to tell us on how soils can deliver these different functions. Now, it's also true that biological indicators are most sensitive to change, but also can be the most expensive to measure. But we're doing a lot of work in Tagus now in terms of new methodologies and, you know, whether that's DNA work in the labs around sequencing for these functional groups in the soil or, you know, even the building now of spectroscopy libraries to be able to get more rapid information on our soil so that we we can more readily deploy advice in that space to make better management um, you know, choices or provide better information um, at a more practical level. So then, of course, you know, um, we're focusing a bit today on carbon and why is soil organic carbon important? So, of course, the main reason is it enhances, you know, carbon sinks. It removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and it can store it in the soil. Um, of course, on uh, above ground biomass, we've our woody biomass and so forth. That's also important. But that soil sink is is the largest terrestrial carbon sink. So it has potential, uh, depending upon management, to be a sink or conversely, it could also become a source. Um, but it also is very synergistic in terms of uh, nutrients and the availability of nutrients. So if you manage your carbon and you try and get carbon, as, as, you, as was mentioned, through organic amendments, um, then you can have better um, retention of macro and micronutrients. 
Um, it helps keep phosphorus available. It reduces bulk density. So this is important because we know compaction is one of the key um, areas. Um, you know, it's the key soil threat associated with the management regime and cycle of soils, management cycle of soils in an Irish context. And if you can reduce compaction, in turn, you can uh, reduce runoff risk. So, for example, phosphorus is susceptible to overland flow, which, of course, can end up in our waterways. So if we can manage these things and start at the crux of it at the soil level and um, then prescribe the appropriate management, we can begin to limit some of the negative environmental impacts, but also enhancing the delivery of other ecosystem services that we need. And of course, it can also improve your soil water holding capacity. And as we can see, you know, weather patterns are changing and, um, you know, water availability is going to be or has been shown to be an issue at different times in recent years. Um, so that element, of course, is also uh, important. So I just wanted to flash this, um, you know, in a picture of, of what is carbon sequestration. So it is that process of capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it in the plant material um, or the soil. So it's important to know, of course, plants also respire about one third um, of the carbon dioxide that they assimilate. That gets re-released as a natural process. And similarly to uh, soils respire. So, um, you know, microbes respire. And then, of course, you can have uh, losses back to the atmosphere that way. And um, so as a rule of thumb, it's estimated that about 10 percent of what's taken in is what can be sequestered or what is sequestered. So those systems that sequester more than they emit, those are our sinks. Those are what we want to really target and work towards enhancing um, and, of course, limiting those that are um, carbon sources. So um, we know, of course, that our organic soils, they're so, so rich in carbon. Um, if they're not managed appropriately, that means they're very susceptible to having a lot of carbon to lose. So that's why on balance, even though our mineral soils um, in general um, sequester carbon, this is offset by this, um, you know, emission source from these drained organic soils. So this is really something to think about and, and how we can manage that better. And of course, um, you know, in Tagus, you know, we have our agricultural marginal abatement cost curve, which is uh, measures their mitigation potential associated with their cost along the y axis. So in addition to an agricultural one, we also have one that looks at land use carbon sequestration. So things like straw incorporation, what's the benefit of that? It's a, a more expensive measure than, for example, if we look at the, the left hand side pasture management um which can be cost beneficial and we see there are areas like forestry cover crops and this water table management these are all important elements and aspects to look at in terms of land use and sequestering carbon and of course as become uh, as new science becomes available then we add to this uh, max so for example you know when we have the information from the hedgerow research this too can then be incorporated into this uh, mac and so the idea is that we continue to to, to keep trying to refine what we know and generate new science to support uh, the sector going forward. Um, I just want to mention this aspect that it is very difficult to measure um, because you've very small inputs. Uh, you know, if you think if you've quarter a half a ton into a very, very large uh, pool of a several hundred um, ton, then it can be very hard to see that change. So the buildup is very slow. Um, but what we are doing now is we are really trying to uh, get a handle on this for our different soil types across Ireland. And, uh, you know, I know earlier there was mention around understanding um, soil testing and so forth. But in addition to that, we also need to know for which soil types, because soils are all quite different, um, under which environmental can regime associated with which management um, will generate which consequence in terms of carbon. So, you know, we have organic soils or we've mineral soils, but within mineral soils, you have a whole suite of other different soil types. And so we're really working hard to refine that in the Irish context. And 
And one of the big developments recently, of course, is that we have eddy covariance towers uh, going up around uh, the country. And so this will help us to constrain um, those models. And what that will mean is, for example, we have now a signpost program that will take soil measurements across the country, across a range of farming systems. Uh, but we will be able to then constrain models using these flux measurements from these towers that can then feed into our so-called biogeochemical models, um, which can then allow us to get credit um, or better refinement of our figures in our inventories going forward. And then that's when we can move to the stage of having the sequestration uh, counted. So uh, very briefly, I know we're, we're caught for time, but just in terms of some other research, we've been looking at carbon um, sequestration and subsoil. Um, you know, we know certain soils have greater capacity to sort carbon at depth below 30 centimetres, even though inventories uh, only account for the top 30 centimetres. Um, but what you can see across all of these soils is that they do sequester a lot of carbon at depth. But what's interesting is even though we know biophysically poorly drained soils can uh, in general accumulate more carbon at depth in this study, they did not show, um, they didn't show that. So what we believe here, or the hypothesis is that those soils are more susceptible to compaction. And so it's a management factor is overriding the carbon potential in that instance. Um, also, um, you know, we've been looking for a long time at understanding which management practices, you know, you convert if you do a land use change from grassland to cropland, uh, you're going to lose a lot of carbon. But then also, what are the different ways we can build that up in, for example, in terms of our uh, tillage regime and also things like straw incorporation. And also, we've a lot of different uh, research going on here in Johnstown Castle, looking at burying carbon at depth and looking at different species um, that will allow us better understand the potential of some of these um, systems in terms of how they can respond to meeting the objectives we need to, to achieve. Uh, also, we've talked about it a bit already today. So we know that hedgerows are important in our agricultural landscapes. And so the work, as I mentioned earlier, um, we've been looking at uh, ways that we can assess carbon stock change over time. And this then will allow us to know on balance, are our hedges a source or a sink of emissions? So to do that, we had to take some direct measurements of our different carbon pools and relate those to some remote measurements. And now we have equations that can relate a, a projected volume from a remote measurement uh, to something that has been measured and can be related um, to a carbon stock. And of course, uh, well, across, even though they're very different in terms of, of the stocks you might have in different hedgerows, um, on average, across the ones we looked at, we had 58 tonnes of carbon per hectare uh, above ground and 10 uh, below. And as mentioned, wider and bigger hedges, they have greater capacity to sequester carbon and they also have a benefit um, for biodiversity. And then with respect to the management, um, you know, over trimming, you're going to limit that potential um, in terms of biomass accumulation. So in the end, uh, what we will be aiming for is to have the capacity to have full knowledge or robust knowledge around Irish soils in terms of their sequestration capacity at the level of different high level soil types. Uh, we want to know the impact of management strategies in mineral soils, design strategies to reduce carbon losses from organic soils, uh, in, you know, increase our capacity in terms of modeling these and provide then, of course, the information to support uh, carbon accounting in terms of agricultural soils. So thank you very much. I leave it there. And oops. Lillian, thank you yeah. very much again sure. for okay. We'll thank you very stop. much <laughs> again for a fantastic presentation. And really and truly, you are really hitting the, the main aspects of the whole thing as regarding carbon, carbon storage and sequestration and soil biodiversity is hugely important. And as we all know that. Um, you know, even at government level, at national level, we have declared a biodiversity, uh, biodiversity. And when we speak of soil, Lillian, um, obviously it's not just the dirt in the ground that you're driving the tractor over or the, the medium you're using to grow crops and grass. That is a world of its own. That is the whole um, habitat itself full of mm, soil yeah. science and biological life and mm. ecology and everything. And, um, you know, I think 
you know, it's a, it's a whole new um, skill um, both advisors and farmers have to have to develop and learn to work with what's there, Lillian. Yeah, certainly. I just, you know, they often use this, uh, you know, you've more microbes in a teaspoon of soil than you have people on the planet. So that just give you a sense of the complexity of what we are dealing with there. But at the same time, there is enormous potential, of course. Obviously, it's a, a genetic reservoir for all of our, our medical products and everything else that we use that we don't even automatically think about. And so we have to be really mindful, um, but also, you know, be smart about unlocking its potential, you know. And I, I think that's the direction of travel. And it can, you know, like any of us, if, if we're confronted with the food source every day, then we don't maybe have to work too hard. And the idea is let the system work itself uh, better, you know, and, and that's the direction of travel, certainly in terms of what's expected, um, you know, from the soil and from the science too, you know, to find this out. And, and you know, Lillian, before we move on to um, to Dr. McMillian, um, you know, what was at that um, presentation last week um, in Ashtown there regarding the launch of the Signpost programme. And again, it was a fantastic presentation on behalf of Chagas. And it's simply, you know, it's it's great to be able to to be able to generate and to use this information going forward and get the farmers involved as well for all our benefits. And it's it's nationally and strategically very important and we wish you great success with that. Thanks, Yeah, And, and could I just say, uh, with that, any of it doesn't matter unless it's happening on farms. So Correct. That's any, any of what we do, um, so we can't do with farmers, or sorry, we can't do without farmers uh, to get the level of research that and science that we need. Uh, but uh, we also need farmers to accelerate what we know works. And so um, everything we do relies on our farmers and our land managers and the more we can work together, we can really exploit the innovative potential because farmers know best or why things might not work in a way that someone who's doing the research mightn't readily know. And so if the, the stronger we can work together to find the solutions, then then that's a that's hopefully a, a win win is, is, is what we would hope for. And thank you for that. We appreciate that. Thanks, Lillian. Um, OK. Um, Dr. McBenna, we'll move on to yourself next one regarding your farm carbon EIP. So you can let you work away on that. So, okay. Hey, can you can you all hear me? Yes, we we are just here. Yep. And you can see the presentation as well. Yeah, it's up here. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation, and thanks to everyone for coming to listen to me. So I think I'm the last speaker. So I'll uh, uh, after a whole series of excellent presentations. So I'll, I'll try and keep us awake. Hopefully, uh, you've been hit with a whole load of a very valuable information there. So uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do. So just uh, very briefly, just to introduce, so it's the farm carbon EIP. Uh, it's not soil carbon EIP. It was just a, a, a typo there. So what we, we're charged with doing is looking at the um, management of peat pastures, which is a very significant source of CO2 emissions. Again, with the benefit of hindsight and looking at my presentation, I forgot the key statistics in there. So I'm just going to call it out, you know, when we're talking about peat soils, they're a very significant carbon store. About 3% of the world's land area is peat, but it contains about 30% of the world's carbon stores because of this capacity for the carbon to accumulate continuously on, on, on previous uh, deposits. Um, in Ireland, it's about 21% uh, of the land mass is considered to be peat soil, but that's nearly 60% of our carbon stores, and that's about 2.2 billion tons, I think is one of the estimates that we're looking at. So in terms of the, the project that we're uh, implementing, yeah, so this is just on the left there. We we also work with landowners and mayor to help them re-wet peatlands, uh, but obviously the, the farm carbon EIP is the main focus of our activities. And what we're aiming to do there is essentially look at the before and after. So we've done baselines. Uh, we have, you can see we have about 20 odd farms. Uh, in and around, you can see on the right hand side here. So it's essentially uh, peat farmers of peat pasture within a certain distance of the Little Brosna, the Kamker, and the Silver Rivers in Offaly mainly, but also spilling over into to, to Leash and uh, North Tip. And we'll, there's a range of different peat land uses. So the, there's the improved peat pasture, there's what I call rough grazing, semi natural pasture, but then there's also the cut over, the cut over woodland. The, the intact or the degraded bog and so on. So we've looked at all of those 
and we've we've measured the carbon storage in each of them um just to see what we're looking at and in terms of the baseline studies we're looking at the biodiversities the peat stocks the peat soil chemistry so nutrients micronutrients physical properties poor waters microbes fungi and nematodes uh, and then in conjunction with i think lydian was just touching on it there the national soil carbon observatory we're going to have a, an eddy covariance towers on one of on one of the farms and also with the rewet project one of the key things in relation to determining the rate of emissions of Greenhouse gases from peat soil is essentially the depth of the water tables. So the Rework Project has installed a series of wells across the country and, and on, on our farms as well. So essentially, this is going to be a key means of determining um, what the emission rate is uh, from these pastures. Yeah, we're also looking at the water quality as well. So we have the you know the water chemistry and the the biotic quality index to see what the the uh, the rating of the river is and costings also. So. Uh, the aim then is once where we've we've done rewettings and we're in the process of doing that at the moment, is that we come back subsequently and see what has changed in terms of the all of those things. And we're looking at trying to integrate all of those different parameters in a, a three pillar environmental approach. And the same research we think would, would fits well in terms of looking at an Irish peatland code maybe as a potential for generating income for the non farm not the unfarmed parts of every farm uh, in this case um and yeah with that we'd be looking to to help uh, produce evidence-based policies and in this and in relation to peatlands just to be clear it's avoided greenhouse gas emissions that you're talking about uh peatland soils fens are quite productive or pretty can be quite very productive raised bogs not so much uh so peat soils uh aren't ever going to sequester a lot it's only ever going to really be about uh, reducing those very high emission levels which i think was in a previous presentation it's the range is about 10 to 30 tons per hectare per year so that the reweighting process is only going to avoid emissions it's never going to come back to a very high rate of sequestration uh, except in uh, some rare circumstances uh, yeah so that's just some of the baselines so here's one of my colleagues dr heaton there he's doing a bit of peat depth thing so we've done a lot of that i haven't done the calcs on how many kilometers of peat that he's depth but it would be quite high certainly running into dozens of kilometers and he's bravely uh probing kilcarran fervil bog there which is about 10 meters deep so a lot of work involved so bacteria biodiversity water quality and so on as i mentioned we're also just again because we have a um collaboration with um a North Pennines AMB and Yorkshire Peat Partnership. We've done a lot of peat restoration work. They use drones, so we're we're using uh, multispectral drones uh in collaboration with them. This is one of them over in North Pennines. And uh we are looking, I suppose, in terms of uh peat habitat restoration, you can correlate the actual the vegetation as a proxy for what emissions are coming off of the bog. So if it's sphagnum. A lot of sphagnum is going to be maybe sequestering, and then as that is as that reduces, and there's more heather and other vegetation as the peat is damaged, then you're going to get increasing rates of emissions. Uh, and then we're also hoping to be looking at uh, using lidar drones in the new year to look at the actual biomass on the farms that we're we're working on in the hedgerows and, and the woodlands. Uh, so just what I call the carbon findings, we've surveyed about 160 hectares. Within that, we estimate there's about 260,000 tons of carbon stored. Uh, and depending on the emission factors that are available, and again, obviously, the NASCO figures, you know, the, the site-specific data is going to be key in refining these. But you can see, it essentially, uh, depending on which, which figures you take, you're going to range from 680 to 1,000 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions coming off of those 160 hectares every year um so that's a very significant amount just again just to point out uh we have all of the different habitats classified but as you can see here in this figure on the left hand column we have the average uh peat uh, sorry carbon storage within the peat obviously the intact even if they're degraded raised bogs have very very high quantities of stored carbon uh reducing as you depend on how much has been cut away essentially the lowest figure is for the cut uh where's it gone yeah cut over blanket bog is very low uh, and then after that semi-natural pasture and so on but still very you know a very significant amount of carbon uh, in each of these habitats uh, just to give you an idea as they say a picture tells a thousand words so you know you can throw figures at people all you like and you're like well what does that mean so i suppose i this is a really good image 
just to give you a, a flavor of what we're talking about. So this is a bit of residual in, well, obviously it's probably quite drained, but uncut over blanket bog up in, I think this is in Scotland. And as you can see, there's more carbon in that little bit of peat bog that's left and that hasn't been planted than in all of the plantations around that little bit of peat. So we're talking about very high quantities. And again, just to reiterate, as I was saying, is the capacity of peat to accumulate on top of itself. Uh, it's not so much the productivity, it's just the fact that it can just go on accumulating forever. Um, just a little bit about the, what, is, what are the effects when you drain peat, you know, what's, what are the advantages? So obviously you're lowering the groundwater. You can, you know, a, a healthy bog is about, healthy peatland can be 95% water. So, you know, if you're walking on a healthy bog, that's as close as you're going to come to walking on water. Uh, so to do anything, you need to reduce that down to about 80, 85%, which is where the drainage comes in. So hence you, you reduce the level of saturation and of course you can bring in livestock and machinery and, and, and or cut the, cut the peat for fuel as we've, had, we've done over generations to heat our houses. Uh, again, also the peat oxidizing is going to release nitrates and sulfur and it gives a good nitrogen supply to crops. Um, and it, it has a, a excellent water, provides, it's an excellent supplier of water to any crops. Uh, just to make the point, though, the problem with that, I suppose the, the problem lies therein, uh, the, this process of supplying nitrates and sulfur, it comes from the actual destruction of the peat. As the previous speaker mentioned, you know, peat is accumulating because it's anoxic and it's waterlogged. The bacteria, the fungi can't get in to eat the carbon that's accumulated uh, as, it sh as it would do in a mineral soil. So this, this is why it will accumulate. So therein lies the problem. So the, the disadvantages, again, it depends. How, again, if it's cut away, um, only likely you'll be in the acid bog, you know, which is going to be very infertile. We need a lot of lime and treatment. It has a relatively low phosphorus supply. Uh, and then, of course, it doesn't hold on to the phosphate. Just uh, in the pictures there on the right hand side, uh, I think it's, it's showing the issue. So this is just uh, what the, the, the Holm Fen post. I think it's the lowest point in England. It was drained. It was a bog that was drained back in the 19th century. The landowner at the time fancied he had a notion that bogs were like big sponges and that when you squeeze them, essentially the water would come out. Well, he, he didn't understand the whole degradation process, but he, he had the presence of mind to sink this post to the bottom of the peat. So this is in the bottom of every peat bog that's going to be marl or lac, which is the bottom of the old lake bed in which the in the which the bog formed. And as you can see, in the last hundred or so years, 14 feet of peat has oxidized away into the air. Most of it would be into the air, maybe 70, 80%, and into the water. So dissolved organic carbon and nutrient and nitrates would be released into the waterways. So that's where it's gone. It's disappeared into the atmosphere. And this is the issue. Um, yeah, so I mentioned already, so the rates can be 10 to 30 tons per hectare per year, and that will equate to about two centimeters to one inch of peat being lost every year. That's massively accelerated. If where you're growing crops for tillage, that's, that's accelerated massively, but that would be the rate of loss. And again, in the fields that we're looking at, where the fields have been reclaimed, you see the where the bog previously would have had trees in, those tree stumps are now emerging from the peat because essentially the peat is sinking every year. So it really is a kind of type of soil mining. You're fueling the grass productivity with the loss of the peat. Um, so if you've got a fairly shallow heat bed, then that's going to be an issue. Again, now obviously that decreases water supply and you get eutrophication of waters as an issue arising from this. Um, yeah, after rewetting, so obviously there's less bearing capacity. So we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be measuring the prenatural logger as what's the resistance where the peats are rewetted. And again, previous speaker said rewetting is not turning into a lake, it's just raising the water table. It will still remain grassland, but it's just going to be wet. The water level is going to be ideally within 20, 30 centimeters of, of the of the field surface. Decrease nitrogen supply. And of course, Crops, particularly ryegrass, probably isn't gonna isn't gonna respond very well. So we're looking at doing trials uh, with mixes of appropriate uh, wet loving grasses and legumes and uh, um, herbs that would grow well in these conditions. The other issue is that when you rewet, initially you get what's called a methane burp, where you know where you do get uh, carbon that is degraded in an anoxic environment. So you get methane, which is a significant greenhouse gas. But overall, the rate of reduction of CO two loss 
outweighs the, the issue of the methane. And then as the peat soil settles into its re-wetted nature, then the methane levels uh, decline. Um, so that's, that's, that's that. Here's just the graph. This is an integrated graph with your methane and your carbon dioxide integrated. Nitrous oxide is, is pretty much negligible. According to all the research, it doesn't really have a big make a big contribution to the greenhouse gas emissions from peat soils. But as you can see, this is essentially the, the water table here on the left-hand side at the top. You're looking at, the, again, the figures echoed earlier by earlier speakers, 20 to 30, 28 to 30 tons, uh, decreasing as you come, as you bring the water table up to the surface. So the key thing here is to be able to do this, but at, at the same time maintain, uh, you know, possibility of grazing for the farmers. Um, one of the ways we're looking at that, as I said, is uh, that we will we are looking at, uh, I suppose the, the term is polluter culture, so wet agriculture, there's just the definition, Product, productive land use of wet peatlands that will stop that subsidence and it minimizes emissions, and that of course depends on having crops that are quite happy to grow with their feet in water. And there's a range of different ones. So this is one of them, cattails or bulrushes is probably how they're better known to people. This has a lot of potential. Um, for producing building materials, biomass, and other other crops, uh, wet grassland obviously is the or kind of you know grass that doesn't mind growing in wet conditions and still produces is key. Um, other things is you can have again a lot of this uh, reclaimed uh, peatland is essentially fen peat, so it's relatively fertile and it's also quite shallow. So in those instances, you can have uh, the possibility of rewetting that and growing trees, so poplar, all the willow, will all grow well in those conditions. So again, we're gonna be looking at that. And then we're also looking at maybe landscape level options where there's a number of farmers around one bog, say for example, we'd be looking at maybe working with everyone and see if we can't get a, a kind of a big win in terms of repairing that, uh, re-wetting that area. And there's just an example of one of the bogs. Just, just to give you an idea, this is about 100 acres in size, 99, 100 acres. So the intact bog has got about 94,000 tons of carbon. The cutover is about 19,000 and the woodland has about 8,000 tons. And they're the range of emissions uh, from that. Quite a lot less than the pastures, but still quite significant. Um, yeah, so the bu fuel building materials, so there's a common reed, Phragmites australis, cattails of bulrush, Typhon gustifolius, we've got a feasibility study on that, so we'll be hoping to, to trial that in suitable locations. Timber would include, as I said, all the poplar willow, uh, the, where the peat is acid, this wouldn't be the fen peat, no, but also on the fen peat, uh, you know, sphagnum can be grown as a horticultural crop, and then, you know, the kind of grasses that will grow well in wet conditions, creeping bent, red top bent, marsh, foxtail, and so on. Uh, here's just and just at the bottom you can see here this is the material that the benefit of cattail for building materials is it's got a lot of air filled plant cells holding an upright which makes it structurally very strong relatively insulative and quite fire resistant so again you'll all be aware from Grenfell Towers essentially that a lot of insulation is solid petrol I think some people have described it as so it could be a and of course that would be fully biodegradable um, just here's a, a typical farm that we have done a farm plan for. It's on the edge of a cutaway bog. And you can see this area on the right here is where we can re-wet. Uh, and this is just the range. Again, the, I think Declan was saying we'd be circulating these. This is the range of emissions coming from this. So this is the, the part, the grazing areas that can be re-wet. And then in the jet, because it's butting onto some peat bank and some cutover woodland, we've also been able to re-wet that as well. And uh, again, we've been looking at multi-species swords and mob grazing and all the other things. Peatland code, just very quickly. Um, again, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm probably way over my 10 minutes there. Uh, no, sorry about that. Um, Fine, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so <laughs> we're also using the same information and some of our research to work on what, uh, an Irish peatland code. You know, there's a lot of landowner land. I think it's about 70% odd that's owned by farmers and others. Uh, of abandoned peatlands or maybe that's not being used for anything and wouldn't be part of the farm you know certainly not the productive part of the farm so we think a code whereby private finance for companies looking to do their uh, carbon neutrality commitments would be something useful so we're working on that and broadly speaking there's the two approaches you can see at the bottom there's the one for the intact peatland ecosystems which would include blanket bogs and raised bogs again what you can what you can say is if it's mainly sphagnum, it's probably sequestering, except on a very dry year. 
And then as it gets degraded, you have increasing levels of CO2 emissions. But then the other key level, and this, this is what the Dutch peak code, the Green Deal here, the national Kufstadt marked, is essentially the water levels very closely correlate with the rate of CO2 emissions. Um, and as I mentioned, it's the avoided emissions. It's not what you're going to sequester in that peatland. It's just locking in the carbon that's already there, which you've seen earlier is, is very significant, even for relatively small areas. Uh, it's also a much safer bet, we would argue, than uh, trees. Again, I think you've all seen with the uh, the increased fire risk. I'm sure there's a lot of carbon offset projects, which would be timber based, which are now gone up in smoke. So if you re-wet a bog or peatlands, it's it's not going to burn or it's much less likely. And, and then I think also from an industry perspective, it has a potential higher value because you get more money up front because you get the reduction in emissions very quickly. Whereas if you put plant the forest, you're not going to get the bulk or you know the full amount of your carbon offset money until they've been grown for 30 or 40, 50 years, depending on the length of the contract. Just again, to give you an idea, the scale that we're talking about on the, the, the right-hand side here at the bottom, you can see these, you we're all familiar maybe with the giant redwood forest. Here's a tiny human at the base of this giant redwood. When you're talking about our raised bogs, it would be double the amount of carbon stored and more. Uh, as would be in the giant redwood forest. So uh, just to give you an idea of the scale. Just some of the other whole farm measures that we're looking at. Again, uh, Catherine and Lillian would be delighted to hear. We're looking at hedgerow management plans. So again, just with the process of doing plans for each of the farms where we're looking at each aspect of the hedge and deciding whether they need to be coppiced, whether they can be laid. Again, I think Catherine, um, she may have mentioned it, again, forgive me for repeating myself. Again, if you have an escaped hedge, and there's a nut and, and the gap isn't too large between them, you can actually restore that hedge by doing the laying. So it's very beneficial from that point of view. And again, just to give some of the figures, yeah, again, I won't repeat all of the benefits that's already been done comprehensively, but I saw it's in Offaly where we're largely focused. Uh, the last survey indicated about 40% were unmanaged. And I think the national survey indicated that 90% are low, are low quality. So it's a huge amount of work to be done, a huge, huge potential there. This, again, we have our hedge layer. This uh, hedgerow here is about 10 to 12 years old of closely planted hawthorn. This is his fantasy hedge for laying. Uh, the one at the top, that's that's pretty difficult and Catherine doesn't want us to touch it. So we'll, we'll leave that one alone, but that's the kind of thing that you're looking at. And then also we have uh, sections of good quality native woodland with the key uh, woodland flora on the ground floor and quite good diversity. But in many cases, they might have the canopy trees or there would be, um, ash, which again is going to be an issue as these suffer from dieback and a lot of these 90% or more would be would be lost. So we were, we are trialing an reintroduction of coppicing for the hazelwoods, which would be a traditional practice. Um, and we are uh, planting in standard trees of oak and, and other species that would be appropriate. Again, just uh, coming back to the hedge side of things. So again, we're all aware, it, it, the figure I think in Offaly is about 60 to 70% of all the hedge trees are ash. So again, if we're saying that 90% of those are going to die uh, over the coming uh, years, then we need to be planning for the future. So we'll be planting head, uh, trees back in there uh, just to, to, to try and replace those. And again, the other point to be made is that to maintain the current level of trees in plant in hedgerows you need to have at least 40 percent of them young trees so that would be an issue as well so we need new hedgerow trees and it's also an opportunity uh, we believe to introduce a bit more diversity again ash is good for firewood but you know biodiversity wise oak and cherry and other species uh, and and hawthorn catherine uh, are, are excellent as well um, I think this might be the second last slide just to finish up we're also engaged in a in a pond creation program as well and uh, okay again it's a big hitter in terms of biodiversity fresh water is amazing for wildlife but it's also excellent according to the research for carbon sequestration so you know the mean rate of of laying down of carbon in a pond is much much it's actually the figure is wrong there it's about 20 to 40 times higher than surrounding grasslands and woodlands so if if you were saying that a lot of our ponds might be 100 meters squared that will be actually accumulating as much carbon as the adjacent hectare, sorry, acre of grassland. So they're they're really significant. And again, if they're also adjacent to ditches or streams, they can also have the function of filtering out a lot of the pollutants that might be in there 
uh, coming from the other parts of the landscape. So a very important tool in, in land management. Lastly, I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. Uh, so thanks for hanging in there, everybody. Um, yeah, we're just looking again, multi-species wards have been mentioned. Mob grazing is one of the things we might be trying as well on a couple of the farms. And again, it's a, about reducing the inputs. And I think, again, I, I can be corrected if I'm wrong, but I believe these are approximate figures. So when you're using the fertilizer, there's the embedded carbon in the production of that ton of fertilizer, which I think is about 3.6 tons uh, for average EU production, and it's higher in the rest of the world. And there's also a certain percentage of the nitrate that's applied will be volatilized by bacterial activity in the soil. And that will have been about 1.5% on average, which will also have a significant carbon uh, foot, uh, carbon impact or carbon equivalent, CO2 equivalent in, impact. So again, we feel this would be, uh, this is another, uh, just to echo what the other speakers have been saying, we think this is another important way to, to reduce the carbon uh, footprint of our, of our farms. Okay, I think that's, that's everything I have to uh, say at this stage. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you, I hope I managed to keep you awake and um, perhaps I can hand it back to you now at this stage. Thank you very much, Dr. McMillan. Very interesting there. And that would appear to be a very serious body of work yourself and your team are doing there regarding the whole peatland issue. And, you know, the the, the stat you threw out there at the start that 21% of our soils in Ireland is mainly of a peatland soil. And, you know, obviously the elephant in the room is a huge amount of farmers throughout the country have and are farming those soils. And there would be, I suppose, to put it very simply, a lot of challenges there ahead regarding farming and targets in those areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I suppose, I suppose the, the the obvious one to us, if we can, if we can do that rewetting and keep the grazing, that's that that would seem to be that. So we're doing, we'd be doing trials soon uh, with real, different grass mixes. So we'll see. We'll Hopefully, see. we can we can get that silver bullet. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Um, folks, what I'll do now is hand you back over to John. There are a lot of questions in for our panellists and we'll try and get through those. I'm aware of time. So, John, over to yourself there. Thanks, Noel. Um, thanks to all the panellists as well. I suppose, Doug, when we have you there, just and you've kind of touched on it already, um, just sort of about the the work that's ongoing on, on looking at the grazing capacities and things on on, on those peat soils that... Um, that that the water tables um are being raised on um I don't know could you could you elaborate on that a bit is there anything started or is it sort of in the um I suppose we we've just done the re-wetting works so we need to do the you know we we have the mixes sourced and we're going to be trying our own ones and we need to get those sewn in so I presume that's going to be spring at this stage so I'm afraid not and there isn't a whole lot in the literature according to our soil researcher Dr Molliman so. But yeah, we're, we're trying to get together as much info as we can. And then it is very much a case of kind of, you know, just do it and see, you know. Yeah. I think that's going to be keeping. So I'm afraid I have nothing to uh, give you uh, concretely at the moment, but hopefully in the, you know, the end of next year, we'll have uh, some it's data. It's in the works. Yes, exactly. It's in the pipeline. Very good. Very good. Um, someone's just commented here, Macanthus has the highest evapotranspiration rate of all the grasses um can you see any interest in in using this on peat beds uh i'm not sure about miscanthus uh as i, I mean i've seen it um, in and around kind of carlo wexford area so there's a few miscanthus is all um fields it's on mineral soil i don't know how that grows in peat soils but the obvious ones would be your uh, bulrushes your common reeds and then there'd be good fodder grass as well, reed canary grass, purple small reed, and so on. So we we it hasn't come out when we've been looking at the options. That hasn't come out as one of the things we should be trying. That's grand. Thanks, Doug. Um there's some more questions there for Catherine, just um around the the hedgerows. If we still have her there, yeah. Um I suppose Catherine, is, is the use of a flail detrimental to hedge maintenance? Um, not always, but blunt flails and cutting material that's too strong. And I suppose that's where I worry about the leaving. You know, this is where I'm in favour of the light annual trimming over the kind of leaving it for a couple of years. And then the flail has a, it's, it's very detrimental if it's trying to cut something that's too strong for it. 
But so if that answers the question, you know, a sharp flail is critical and then appropriate material. Thanks, Catherine. And then um, in relation to hedge, hedge cutting contractors, um, is there any sort of current obligations um, for, for best practice or any training? No, or I mean, I, 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 we work with them. Um, I have a certain sympathy for them. They get a huge abuse now if they're seen at all out in public. Uh, and it's very that's very wrong. I mean, but ultimately, it's it's the he who pays the piper. It's the farmer who employs the contractor. The contractors will do everything. Now that doesn't mean they don't need to be educated and more education and more encouragement for doing the right thing. I I would be extremely disappointed, and probably it happens occasionally, but not regularly. Where the contractor would say, you know, I I try, or where the farmer would say, I was trying to tell him what you wanted, and he wouldn't do it. That's almost unheard of because at the end of the day, they are being paid. So, but they do need coming back to our education, public open days, coming back to the signpost. We need to, everybody in on this. It's not just farmers. Um, I mean, my study showed the farmers think the hedge cutters know best. The, far, the hedge cutters do what they think the farmer knows and they're all doing what the neighbour and my elderly relatives who think neat and tidy is the only show in town. That's what they're all working towards. So it's it's the general public, is the, which is, you know, forums like this and getting the general public understanding what, what is good and what's wanted is what we need. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. And then I suppose... Someone's just queried here, dealing with litter fall from trees and, and how to manage that. Um, is there sort of a risk of forest fires, for example? Um, I'll, I'll take that, uh, John. Like, I suppose we'd see it as a positive in the sense that you're increasing the organic matter and, and, and you know, within the soils. Um, it's not seen as a, a huge risk within the forestry sector of, of the fires, you know, Um uh, so it isn't it isn't something that's kind of highlighted within management or, you know, within the removal of it to avoid the forest fires itself as its own warning system and different things. But it wouldn't be seen as, as, as a threat to forest fires. As I said, it's seen positive as it is increasing the organic soil matter and it has a, another layer um, on top of the soil. So that, that would be the view within the sector. That's brilliant. Um, I suppose. Noel, maybe for you, sort of from an advisor's perspective, um, what are what are what are the challenges that you see to to reach in sort of targets um, in terms of maybe organics and emission reductions and, and things like that? Well, you know, as we all, as we all know now, we're at the start of the new or the next cap regime, and we've got the introduction of the recent acre scheme, which is closing Wednesday night, and the new organic scheme, which is closing next Friday. And um, there's a huge, huge interest out there amongst farmers, um, large farmers, um, smaller farmers, maybe that they can't feed because of their limited farm size. They can't, you know, get get as much um, re- re- much money out of the acres. So, again, lots of mixture type of farmers looking at the organic. A lot of farmers out there are nearly organic, John. Um, and obviously, with the last two years, with the price of, as we mentioned before, of our of our fertilizers and our protected ureas, a lot of people haven't used anything. Um, they've gone back to their using their own farmyard manure and slurry and taken more um, careful and more efficient use of it, which is which is free. It's their, their own fertilizer. So again, you know, I think there's going to be a huge um, uptake in organics um, and that's going to spring on other things as well, like more marts are going to develop um, organic outlets. And, you know, it's it's really the, it's really the buzzword, really, at the minute um, amongst farmers. Are you going to join organic or are you not? And look at, in fairness, I suppose previously, organic wouldn't have been, I suppose, considered a main type farming practice. But, you know, all of, all of a sudden, um, you know, there's been a steady growth of organics in the last five years. And that word has spread. And farmers, you know, are great to talk to each other. And, you know, sometimes learning from their own peers is best as well. So again, it's a positive story here on the organics. And again, it's to, you know, it's all about information. It's all about education. And, you know, advisors play a huge role in that at the farm gate. So look at the, an organic farm and ticks a lot of boxes as well as regards to the lower the inputs. And Lenin has talked about it and Catherine and, you know, Doug there as well. The organic scheme and the organic whole ethos ticks a lot of boxes for where we want to go regarding our overall targets. 
That's brilliant. Thanks, Noel. Um, there's one more question that's just come in there. Um, the critical element of nutrient cycling and, and carbon retention, stroke sequestration in mineral soil is fungal biomass. Um, do any of your panelists have any idea how to best promote and manage the amount and diversity of fungal biomass in these soils and how to aid farmers how, how do you farmers to get the best from their soils? Um, I don't know if, if if that's one any of you want to take on, or maybe we could divert divert that to Lillian. I know she had to drop off there, but yeah, I don't I don't know, John. I'm 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 not sure. I'm not sure what um in relation to it, kind of how you best promote it and the management of it. So unfortunately, Conan, I, I can't answer that question for you. Yeah, Lillian probably would have been best placed. Um, yeah. I could say maybe just ecologically, yeah, the more biomass going in, the more you're going to stimulate all of those or billions of organisms in every teaspoon. So, and then the more biodiversity, again, the you know, I would suggest that's a principle. But again, uh, I, I couldn't elaborate as Lillian can. I suppose just to clarify there, we have said to Lillian has sent her apologies. She had to run off to a second meeting, but um, she has said any questions that come in, she will take them and reply in, in person to them. So we will put that question to her. That's brilliant. Um, I suppose then just the, just the last thing, um, resources that are available to maybe anyone that was on the call today. Um, uh, I'm sure you, you all have your own websites and, and different things like that that people can can look up and there's lots of lots of good stuff on there thank you very much john um and yes just to, i suppose to close off where, where john finished off um i suppose with dnrn have been tweeting as we've went along so i think all the tags of all the different speakers are have been have been commented as we went along so if you want to go on twitter and follow following the pages you'll get up-to-date information on that or, or as john said they all have their own websites so um to close i suppose i'd like to thank all of our speakers but in both sessions, they're, they're both fantastic presentations and the level of questions that were answered both on and off screen. We may have heard the ones that were, were answered over the, over the microphone, but there was a, a large volume of questions answered uh, in the chat box, which is brilliant to see. Um, obviously, soil health and emissions are, are vital important to Irish agriculture. And, and for this reason, we all need to be pulled in the same direction, whether that's in terms of policy, research, or the actions actually implemented on farm. And that's why I suppose we, it was great to have such a... A vast, a vast difference in all our different speakers, but yet they all spoke off the same hymn, hymn sheet. So that's brilliant to see. Um, to our to our audience, thanks for your participation and for attending today. It's it's great to see the volume of interest that was there. I think we had up to 100, 100 participants at one stage in the call, which is brilliant. And then finally, to everyone within our own NRN for assisting with the running of this. Um, it was brilliant, and it's great to have have an event like this coming to, to, towards the end of the year. So, if anybody wants any more information, it'll be available on the NRN website, and this video will also be there. So, once again, safe home. Thanks to everybody, and happy Christmas. <laughs>